So I grew up, um, like many kids do, innocent, impressionable, and at the mercy of my parents. Sometimes just at their mercy. Um, there were a few things they wanted me to be when I was a child. One was a model, until they realized that I looked more like a flower sack with arms and legs. <laughs> Second was Rambo, but I definitely looked too fierce for that role. And then the third was a scientist, but as you can see from my bio, that didn't come true either. Um, one influence they did have on me that did stick, though, was their taste in music. My parents loved disco music, and I, in turn, also developed a love for it. Now, the disco that my parents used to listen to was about fun and good times, so it was a little confusing growing up because on TV I would see these documentaries and they either depicted disco as this era of hedonism and debauchery with places like Studio 54, or like this era of cheesiness and tacky style with um, roller disco and polyester suits. So disco, um, history hasn't really shed a very positive light on disco, and it's kind of sad and unfair. I mean, the progress that our society made during one of the flashiest and funkiest times of all time, in my opinion, has been highly underestimated. So part of my goal here today is to reclaim some of the glory that disco deserves. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm not a scientist, but I do still have a lot of scientific tendencies. Uh, much of my background involves studying theories in leadership and psychology. But aside from that, what I love doing best is just making up my own theories. I just make up random theories that don't make sense. Um, one of my theories is that if you just throw that word theory into your sentence, people think you're smarter than you really are. <laughs> so <laughs> I do it all the time until I've gotten this far in life. Um, so try it, try it with your friends. So when I think of our topic today, unconventional leadership, I can't think of a better way to describe it than through what I'm going to call the theory of disco leadership. Um, as I said, the history of disco has been highly underestimated, and so too has the story of the unconventional leader. Um, my theory of unconventional of disco leadership posits that unconventional leaders are the people that came back to prove us wrong, the people that we underestimated because they didn't necessarily fit into our ideas and prescribed molds of what leadership should look like. So today I'm going to share with you some thoughts and lessons from disco leadership. First one is that we all know that disco is synonymous with the 70s, right? But only disco nerds have actually spent the time to look through the intricate history of disco. Lucky and unlucky for you all, I happen to be one of those disco nerds. <laughs> now, in the early 70s, rock and roll dominated the airwaves, right? But in, on the East Coast and clubs, especially in Philadelphia, there was this new sound and dance and eventually an entire culture that was starting to rise up. The word disco was coined to describe the new sound, and the word discotheque was coined to describe the places in which the music was played. All you needed was a DJ, some turntables, and of course a disc in order to get a party started. Now, with disco and with the DJ stuff, we all wonder, well, does art influence culture or does culture influence art? And disco, I think, definitely did both. After the rumbling of civil rights in the 1960s, the disco movement became this inclusive space that welcomed everyone that had been marginalized in the past. Disco also physically changed our society. Um, just thinking of my own parents, they fell in love due in part to having discotheques as an inclusive space for them to date and hang out when they lived in Los Angeles. Um, I have another sub-theory within this disco theory that uh, myself, along with many other racially ambiguous 80s babies, probably would not have been born without the disco era. <laughs> um, it was a funny story, so I was telling my mom about this talk and I asked her, you know, do you have any photos of you and dad from your dating days back at the discotheques? And she told me, well, we didn't really take pictures back then, we don't do this Facebook stuff like you all do, taking photos every five minutes. So um, I've taken creative license to develop what I think <laughs> their dating would have looked like had social media existed back in the day. Yeah, isn't that a cool lamp? It's just like so random. Anyway. Okay, so um, first lesson, disco was radically inclusive. Um, everything from females, people of color, gay men and women, these folks were consistently dominating the billboard charts and posing for covers of magazines. 
Karen Cook was the first female disco DJ in the US. Donna Summer reigned supreme and is forever named the queen of disco. And everyone was subliminally supporting gay rights whenever they sang YMCA by the village people. <laughs> Now, I work at a university, and for those of us that work in higher education, we place a lot of hope in the future of our students, and especially in their capacity to make a positive impact in the world. Unfortunately, a lot of our students get weeded out, not just in the classroom where students are getting weeded out by bell curve grading. I'm talking about students getting weeded out of leadership. We live in a world where it's urgent for us to cultivate a lot of leaders and all types of leaders. And instead, what we're doing is we're prescribing these narrow definitions of leadership that allow some people to pass while other people fail. I know there's a Donna Summer somewhere out there amongst my students just waiting for her time to shine. If only we could get rid of some of the barriers that we put in the way of our young people's stardom, right? So we need to think about what it looks like to be radically inclusive of all types of leadership, because to not do that, will lead to a lot of our students getting pushed out of their opportunities to make our world a better place. Okay, so this brings me to my next lesson. Um, for those of you that have ever read disco lyrics, if you're a disco nerd like I am, what you'll find is that they're all positive. Depressing disco does not exist, I guarantee you. If we look at, I mean, just look at song titles. We've got I'm So Excited by the Pointer Sisters, Celebration by Cool and the Gang, Good Times by Chic, the songs were about fun, love, dancing, and peace. It was basically like Woodstock came back, but this time with some sequins and bell bottoms. <laughs> now, sometimes in the work that we do, um, you know, it can get discouraging or frustrating or depressing, perhaps. And when one person is feeling down in your group, um, it tends to bring everyone else down. It's like a black hole, and it just sucks out the joy from you and from the people that are around you. And this is what leads to people getting stressed or burnt out or just unhappy. So by a show of hands, wondering if you happen to know anyone in your life who is just always really happy, always has a positive outlook about life, like perpetual smile on their face, and it's kind of annoying how happy they are because you don't know why they're always like that, right? Um, and for, yeah, there's always one in the group. And for those of you who didn't raise your hands, it's probably because you are that person in your group. <laughs> Now, those folks that are always happy, sometimes to the point where it's annoying, those are the people that I always want on my team. Because as bubbly and as effervescent as they are, when the going gets tough, they are crucial to your success. I call them disco leaders. <laughs> disco leaders, they have uplifting messages to say whenever the group is feeling bad. Disco leaders know how and exactly when to crack a joke when there's tension in the room. Disco leaders are the folks that are going to bake you cookies when everyone else is too busy to, and doesn't have time to eat. Disco leaders not only have positive energy, but they know how to spread it to others and how to give a group their second wind. Um, two years ago at the university where I work at, we were getting ready for the incoming freshmen to start and move into the residence halls and to start their academic year. And I was working with my student staff. Of course, they waited till the last minute to get their stuff done um, to prepare for the freshmen to move. And you could just read the, the look of stress and exhaustion on their faces. And they were getting snappy at each other. And morale was just low. Um, and at the same time, it was approaching about 1 AM by this point. So just because I work at a university doesn't mean that I still have the sleeping habits of a university student. So I was like, I need to go to bed. If this stuff doesn't get done, it doesn't get done. But this, like, we need to just all stop. So. <laughs> Come back the next morning, expect, you know, everything is left where it was. Instead, to my surprise, I see that there are these beautiful, bright and colorful posters all over the walls. There are welcome signs on every residence door. There are just decorations and balloons everywhere. And just everything is way above what I had imagined, especially different from what happened the night before. So I find my student staff to figure out what the heck happened last night. Like, how did all this stuff get done? And um, Two of my students, Chloe and Ariel, they come up to me and they say, oh, well, we had an EDP last night, and then after that, everything got finished. So in my head, I'm going, OK. Like, I ask them, well, what's an EDP? But in my head, I'm like, is that a drug? Like, are my students doing drugs? Am I going to get fired? I've lost control of my staff. And, they tell, and Chloe and Ariel are like, oh, no, EDP, that's an emergency dance party. Duh, we do that all the time. <laughs> so needless to say, <laughs> 
the rest of that year, whenever they were stressed out or whenever the group needed some motivation, they would call Chloe and Ariel to have one of these scheduled EDPs. <laughs> Disco leaders also know that there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. Um, when I was a second year grad student here at Seattle U, I had a friend named Paige who was in the fir a first year in the program. And at the time I was working for the Dean of Students Office, so I met with students that got in trouble and I learned this new trick in order to get them to tell me the truth in our conduct meetings that we had. You basically ask the same question twice, but the second time you ask it, you say it in a different tone and you add the word really somewhere in there. So I wanted to know how Paige was doing with grad school. How is she adjusting? So I asked her one day after a meeting, I'm like, hey Paige, how is, how is grad school going for you? And Paige turns to me, she's like, oh yeah, grad school's good, you know, it's going well. So then I put the moves on her. <laughs> Paige, how is grad school really going for you? <laughs> and she turns to me and she's like, well, Crystal, you know, grad school is busy and all, and trust that I'll tell you if I'm feeling overwhelmed, but right now, I'm, I'm just too fly to stress. I baked some cookies last night. Do you want one? <laughs> so Paige wasn't waiting for finals week. She wasn't waiting for graduation in order to find happiness. The whole journey for her, every moment she was trying to enjoy. It doesn't cost very much to spend a moment to think positively, right? But to not do that, that could be extremely costly to you and to the groups that you work with. So take the time and invest in your disco leaders. All right, moving along to the last lesson. So the disco market eventually became oversaturated. There were a whole bunch of artists from other genres that were crossing over and changing themselves, and they were trying to fit into this disco trend. Eventually, the thing did become cheesy, and when you have too many people trying to come aboard the soul train, then eventually the whole thing's gonna come screeching to a halt. We do the same thing with crossing over and change regarding leadership. Um, it's just, it's a, I guess it's like a curse of aspiring leaders, right? The fact that we try so hard to change ourselves, to copy what the self-help books say. The fact that we try so hard to change ourselves and to fit into this prescribed mold of what others say leadership should look like when instead maybe we could try having our own leadership styles form around who we already are at our core. Copying yourself is trendy, and trendy could mean losing yourself, right? At the same time, um, one of my favorite spoken word artists, Denizen Kane, he has a piece, um, a quote in his piece, and he says, I've got to change. Lord, I've got to change. The only thing I'm afraid of is staying the same. So if we can't change and we can't stay the same, what the heck do we do? Disco offers a solution, um, this, an idea of evolution, having the humility to accept what doesn't work, having the grace to molt off your old self that no longer fits, and having the courage to reveal the new you underneath. On July 12th, 1979, in Chicago, there was the site of Disco Demolition Night. It was this event that was fueled by racism and homophobia. It was a battle against all the progressiveness that disco stood for. Disco records were burned and the crowds erupted into this massive riot. Now, I once heard that music isn't something that's born, grows up, and dies. Instead, it's more like a phoenix. It comes back to rise in another form. Disco did not die that night. It was not demolished. Um, the rev its revolutionary spirit of peace, love, unity, and respect. Also, it's characteristic rhythms and beats. Those are very much alive in today's electronic music and rave culture. Elements of DJing, as well as the progressive nature of including people that had been ex historically marginalized, that branched off into what we know today as hip hop music. And this is what my, my children will be subjected to. <laughs> um, the writer, Paolo Coelho, he has a great blog, by the way, on top of his books, but in one of his blog posts, he says this quote, um, stop being who you were and change into who you are. And I think this rings very much true for our disco leaders. See, everyone has the capacity to lead because everyone has the capacity to evolve. And we need to evolve because we need to evolve to our ever-changing world and to the ever-changing issues and problems that we need to solve. So failed leadership attempts, those aren't 
death, that's not death, that's a chance at new life. And changing into who you are, that doesn't necessarily mean losing yourself. It's just a chance at finally achieving truly authentic leadership. Okay, so no theory is legit without a model, right? So I've created a very complex model here. Um, we've got, <laughs> this is how our society views leadership. We've got our leaders who are at the top and then followers who are on the bottom of this triangle. And the older we get, the more and more of us, or more and more of us are told either overtly or subconsciously that we are not leadership material. So our triangle widens and there are more followers. But my question I pose to you all is, what if we stopped looking at this model and our model no longer looked like a triangle? You're wondering what this was for. Okay, so what if instead we, were, we thought about being more radically inclusive with how we foster leadership? What if instead everyone felt welcomed and unafraid to shine what if instead everyone had a turn to shine? What a cool world that we could live in if everyone could share their gifts in order to lead us to a just and more humane society, right? And how much cooler would emergency dance parties be with this thing? <laughs> so to me, that's what disco leadership means and that's what unconventional leadership means. It's celebrating, welcoming, and fostering all types of leaders instead of wasting our time underestimating them. Thank you.